good morning. It's me between you and like lunch, right? So hopefully we can have a, a, an hour of fun and be on time for the queue because that's important. Um, so this next hour, I'm going to talk to you about sandboxing.net assemblies for fun profit. But most of all, it's about security, right? Because that's my, my profession. First, let me briefly introduce myself. So my name is Neil Stanis, and I work as a security researcher for Vericode. I have a background in .NET development. Started out developing with the first .NET bits in the early 2000s. Then I moved to security consultancy and ethical hacking. And right now at Vericode, I'm mostly researching everything related to .NET. And we do static analysis of applications. So we check applications for vulnerabilities. If you want to talk more about Vericode, come see me afterwards because this is not a sales pitch, of course. And I will mention Vericode once. You will notice when it will happen. Because today the agenda will be different. We're going to talk about, as I said, sandboxing first. We need to briefly touch a bit about like what are the risks that we're facing if we're developing applications using third-party libraries, right? There are some, some, some different aspects that we need to look into, and I want to give you some broad view on that. Then we're going to move a bit more to sandboxing techniques. We have technologies like browsers that use sandboxes for specific reasons. We see new technology stacks like, for example, WebAssembly also introduce a sandbox, as, um, as has been shown in other presentations in this conference. Um, so there's a lot that we can talk about, but I want you to have a bit of a concept on that. Then we're going to move to code and we're going to take a library and we're going to create a sandbox and we're going to uh, hopefully be successful. I can already say to you, we're going we're gonna to have something that, that will work, but it will be a sandbox, of course, with limited capabilities and so on. We're going to dig into that later and then at the end, conclusion Q&A. Um, I will use references to articles. All the links of the articles are in the slides. And if you go to the repo that's at the end of the presentation, there's a link and you will find that there's a notes version that will have all the links in it. So if you want to have specific resource, then that will be at the end. So third party libraries. I think if you look at the way that we develop libraries or like applications, and if we use libraries and I use myself because I'm, I'm a lazy developer, right? I want to do minimal effort, have maximum results. Um, a big chunk of what we do, like almost 80% plus, um, will consist of third-party libraries that we're using. And of course, that's efficient in time, because why would you reinvent the wheel yourself? Why would you run into problems that somebody else already solved, right? With, with doing, let's say, authentication or cryptography, right? It's like, uh, what, don't do it, right? Just take something that's already there. But the thing, if you then put on the security hat, you should always have some consideration like, hey, how well is it maintained? If I look into a library, uh, if it has been stale for the last couple of years, you can also question like, hey, what do they do maintenance wise? What do they do if security problems occur? Do they have like open transparent stuff of like saying, hey, uh, we found this pr problem, this, this security uh, um, problem. We have fixed it in this release. You need to make sure that you update it, right? That's of course uh, yeah, something you need to be aware of. And also keep in mind, like if a project is run by people in their spare time, like, like they probably don't have a lot of resources to do security compared to, let's say, a commercial project that you buy off the shelf from another company that might have got like a big team that solely focuses on security, right? So it's a bit of a difference, but I think it's important to be aware of like, hey, I'm taking this library. Uh, what do I expect from this library? What, I, what do I expect to, to happen, right? Does it do stuff? Um, why should a... Um, PDF generator use binary format internally, like what was, what's the exact reason, like why is that in, right? So there are some, uh, there's a couple of things. If we then look at um, the following piece, and this is the only very good I'm gonna mention. So each year we publish a report, which is called State of Software Security, where we take some of our metrics that we have on customers and we can do some slice and dice and some, some, some business intelligence on it. And the version of last year, V12, showed that almost 79% of the libraries never get updated once they're added to a project, which is quite worrisome. If you look at, hey, stuff happens, uh, vulnerabilities are found, they're published, you need to update, right? Because um, in general, like what happens, even with .NET Core, this is one from March, security problems like are found, hopefully disclosed, if you do a good job and if you interact with Microsoft, you even can get money out of it, right? With bug bounties, really cool. And then it needs to be updated, right? So this is a, a problem that occurred in .NET Core that has to do with remote code execution. And it's a CVE, right? You probably have seen that, which is like um, a, a number that will get assigned to a problem that everybody knows, right? So 
this is already one reason to make sure that you are aware of like what type of libraries you're using, what versions you have, right? And you need to update it for security problems. Um, so this is one piece. Like vulnerabilities are found need to be fixed. What else could happen with, with libraries? Libraries could get hijacked. Um, this is one that's related to an NPM package called UI, uh, UA parser, which was used to parse user agent strings in the NPM ecosystem. Uh, it turned out that somebody grabbed hold of credentials of one of the maintainers and published a version that had crypto mining stuff inside of it, and it would also steal username and passwords. Right? So that's more like a malicious approach of, hey, if I can get this library and if it's widely used, um, then the, that there's a lot there's a lot to gain, right? And if you have a goal of maybe getting secrets or maybe even grabbing compute, having the ability to execute stuff, right? That's even that can even be of value of somebody of maybe, uh, let's say, an, an attacker or nation state, right? You can be as broad as possible. It makes sense to um, be, be aware of this, right? So this is um, something which is more in the trend of like, stuff can also become malicious. And in this case, NPM, the, the credentials of this maintainer was stolen. So what did GitHub luckily do is they saw the problem, and this is maybe a bit too small, but the article talks about the fact that all maintainers should have two-factor authentication turned on on their account. So, meaning multi-factor, right? So, OTP like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator, where you have the codes that rotate and your password. So, if one of those gets stolen, let's say a password, then somebody would not have access because he needs to have that second factor, which is a good thing. They pushed it. They start talking about it in November and in December, they said like, hey, everybody should have this in, maintainers. So, good step forward, at least for the NPM ecosystem. So, security problems, malicious people that have different intentions with libraries, right? Those are the second thing. And that's even with the NuGet system, there's a third variant. So this was a piece of research that was uh, done by a company called Reversing Labs, and it was published, I think, somewhere late last year, um, where they dug into the NuGet ecosystem. And what they did is they looked into libraries and packages, and they saw that some of the libraries have statically linked uh, DLLs or assemblies inside of the package. And what they figured out is that, say, for example, there was a WinSCP helper that could do some copying, right, with the help of SSH, which was a library, and it had a native library inside of it that would that will do the SCP things. Of course, probably called throughout interop from .NET to that library. But that thing was outdated, and that was hardly statically linked inside the package, and had vulnerabilities for at least a couple of years already. Right, so you would say, like, hey, I get this NuGet package, but because it's a dependency that's statically linked, right, it's different than I got this NuGet package, and with that comes this whole transitive trees of dependencies. I will give you an example in the demo. Once we start out, you will add one package, but you will get like five for free because it relies on those packages, right? There's never one single thing. It always will add a couple of things, but because they are statically linked inside, you cannot see it. And this was one problem. And there was even a worse situation where somebody created a library that included a Zlib, Zlib compression library uh, inside of it compiled. And that thing you cannot grab any binaries for, but you need to compile it yourself. They were able to look at the heuristics of the, the, of the system of the library itself. And they were, they were able to correlate it back to a version of source. It turned out that that one was vulnerable since 2005. So that one is, is inside of a NuGet package. You will say, hey, I'm doing compression stuff but it uses a native library, which is outdated, has a lot of problems, so, and it's not visible. I think that's the biggest problem for this, for this situation. So that's like a third variant of what, what could possibly go wrong with third-party libraries. And then the problem itself, and you probably are aware of cartoons that are created by, by XKDC, DC, right? We have the SQL injection with Bobby drop tables. This is one they published and I saw it and I'm literally using it for every presentation I'm doing about security because this exactly illustrates like what the problem is. And they talk about all modern digital infrastructure, but we can just replace it with, with any architecture, software architecture, right? And somewhere underneath there's that small library piece that has been thanklessly maintained since 2003 by some random person who lives in Nebraska, right? And for some of the open source libraries, that is the case. People are doing that. and. You could probably imagine like, hey, if that one get compromised, as we have seen with the previous examples, or if something is broken, then 
that will be disastrous, right? And then that's something to be aware of, that there is a whole chain. Even with stuff like supply chain, and I'm also doing talks on that, which is like a solely different problem, getting from source to binaries, third party libraries always play a big role in that. And um, this is just a nice cartoon that I want to share. But getting back to what we're here for, and it's sandboxy.net assemblies. I think the question I asked myself when I started out doing this is that, hey, is there a way for us to do a better job, right? Because if you take a NuGet package, um, would there be a possibility for us to take that package and reduce the security risks by doing that? So uh, pull in the library um, and then use it in a good way. And as you saw in the previous examples, I'm just assuming that at some point the library will be compromised or hacked. It's just a matter of like, it's not a matter of how, but it's more like a matter of like when it will happen. It will just happen in the future. I think that's good to assume. So based on this, what can we do? Um, I also set some of the following goals. I want to be able just to grab the package from NuGet and use it as is. No modifications, right? You can probably grab the source code that somebody else developed, which and then put some fixes in or change behavior if that's something that you want to do. But I think that's not what I that's not what I want to achieve with this. I just want to use it as is, right? Unmodified. Um, and then we should look into that. So can we maybe create a restricted sandbox? A controlled restricted sandbox with limited capabilities, right? So with less stuff to do. So it, it should not be allowed to do certain things. A brief side step to sandboxing and what sandboxing is, because there are different um, uh, approaches. And I think the one that everybody probably uses in this room, of course, is inside your browser. The browser sandbox of, let's say, Chromium or Firefox, right? And in the past, browsers, when they were like um, running on your system and had full access, maybe even like to all the system resources, that of course caused problems in the beginning. So they decided like, hey, uh, if we render a site, let's say Chrome, I believe, has a tab, each process will have it, its own, like each tab will have its own process. And if it then wants to do something on the system, it needs to call an IPC, so an inter-process communication channel, and ask like, hey, I want to do a file upload, I want to select a file from the system, am I allowed to do that? And based on that, the browser has got like a policy engine and it will check. And that, of course, reduces the risk, right? So at that point, the sandbox can decide like, hey, you're not allowed to do it. And that, of course, reduces the risk if some malicious site gets loaded and it wants to sideload some, some, some malware and it wants to execute that and it wants to interact with the system, then this is probably the first stop where it hopefully um, like stops and the and it's not successful in what they do. Firefox and Chrome, they're competing, right? They have sandbox technologies themselves, which is good because it's almost the same as Java versus C Sharp. Both are good languages, right? But if they compete towards each other, they will have similar features and they will look at each other saying like, hey, I want to have the same. Um, this is a similar thing. I think Firefox has got some concept. I think it's like container and site isolation. That's really solid because what you can do, you can say like, hey, I want to only use this container version of Firefox for my banking, and that's it. And that's the only thing that that browser window will do only for the banking. And there's an analogy with that. If you use a mobile app and do mobile banking on your app, um, I'm always saying like, that's probably by far the securest way of doing banking because it's a controlled app. It's developed by the, 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 the bank itself, hopefully with security in mind, right? But it's highly controlled. They can, they can publish new versions if needed, but it's a single purpose app. It only has one purpose. And if you do that with the browser, that's exactly the same. You should not have a window banking and then move to Facebook or something else. That's, that's not a good idea, right? You maybe want to have some isolation. So that's what the browser gives us. And I think that's, a, that's, that's the concept of sandboxing in different ways. If we then look at new technology stacks and something like the WebAssembly, and then it more like a compile target, right? So we can write code in Rust or C Sharp even, and we can create a WebAssembly module out of it and we can execute. WebAssembly has pretty strong security in mind, like the way that it deals with modules, how they get loaded. The memory itself is linear, right? So it only has access to its own part of memory. It cannot easily access something else unless you say it's allowed to do so. It's pretty cool. Um, and with the whole, we need to get WebAssembly out of the browser, they introduced a thing called WASI, which stands for WebAssembly System Interface, right? So all the cloud loads, you see stuff happening. Um, this thing that's done by, I think it's like Fermon, uh, Subort, Sub, 
I'm not going to pronounce that name, but they have like different company startups. They all do cloud native stuff and they all run web assemblies. And I think it's going to be pretty significant over the next couple of years. But the nice thing is that WebAssembly has its own sandbox and it has a concept called nano process. And the cartoon you see on the right hand side, and maybe the text is a bit too small, but that one was created by Lynn Clark and she's also part of the Bytecode Alliance and she works for Fastly. She used to work for Mozilla Firefox. And she does a lot of stuff with WebAssembly. She has like a lot of good explanations on those security features. If you want to see and if you want to understand, go to code cartoons. But what happens there is you see like there's a transitive tree of dependencies on the right. And the top one started out the process. And then at some point, the one on the bottom with the mask on has become malicious and wants to do a bit more. And he wants to maybe have access to uh, some kind of open syscall, right? That's what it says. And because the first module is in control of what's executed, it can say like, hey, you're not allowed to do that. WebAssembly nanoprocess can, can block that. So that, that's one of the reasons why they're doing that. So this in, in essence is uh, a sandbox in a good way. And it still depends a bit on how the runtimes are implemented. That happens with, let's say, Wasmer and Wasm time. Um, if they fail on implementing this right, then we are maybe in a problem. But this is, I think it's good because it's been done from, from the start. And if we even look at .NET, and if we look at the first bits of .NET, even when I started out my development, you would say like, hey, Niels, there has been similar things within .NET. And there was a concept called code access security. And it has been around since the first release. Um, so the picture you see on the bottom of this is um, one of the drawings I took from a writing secure code book, which is done by Michael Howard, written in the early 2000s. That book is still applicable. It still explains the problems we're facing right now. Um, but with code access security, there's like an evidence-based model. So code would have an origin where it's being loaded from, which can be, of course, the internet, right? It might have been signed by somebody. That's also a piece of evidence. And based on that, the intersection could allow somebody to have access to system resources. So let's say if you download an app from the internet, it might not have a file system access. You would not allow it. That's what code access security was capable of doing. And one of the concepts they used is called stack walks. And that was against luring attacks. So that's the same type of attack you saw in the picture before with WebAssembly with one malicious like module that wants to do something. In this case, it's about a librarian. <laughs> and Carol asks Vicky, asks Sandy to lend a book from the librarian, which is quite complicated, but you just should see it as method ASC calls V calls S to do something. And the policy that the librarian enforces is that everybody needs to be a member of this library in order to do like or like to lend books, right? I cannot walk into the library over here in Porto, walk in, grab a book, walk outside. That's not how it works. Um, so only those who have a library card should be able to borrow books. And in this case, Carol doesn't have one. So what then happens at runtime is that it does a stack walk and it will do a check for each of the colleagues to see like, hey, are you allowed to do that? So Overall, this model was pretty granular, <laughs> but I think that's also one of the problems it had because it was too complex, right? And since .NET 4, they completely removed it. I think there are still a couple of types inside the BCL, but it's not like available for you to use anymore. And they say like, hey, just move to the process, move the stuff to a separate process, right? Because that's also a, a way of isolating things. Um, but that's not what I want, right? I want to use one single code base. I think code access security, the most practical example you probably have run into is the medium trust with ASP.NET, right? So at some point you could do that in the web config and that would allow people in a shared hosting environment, for example, not to access temporary files. Because in the early days, a web hoster usually had like one IS running with all customers inside of it. And if I put in an ASP.NET app, I could just access all the files of the other uh, system, like all the other web applications, web applications as well. So that was one of that was that was a good feature. But as I said, it was probably too complex to um, administer and to work with it. There's a book, a blue book about .NET Framework security. It's like I think it's even like this thick, shows you all the examples you can do. And maybe it was a bit too early. Even with Silverlight, they decided not to implement it. But Silverlight would have been the right analogy to WebAssembly to do these similar kinds of things, right? to do that WebAssembly nano process, but then on Silverlight with Code Six security. So unfortunately, it was a bit too early. I think, uh, yeah, I've worked with it myself. It, it's, it's just too complex, it didn't work. So um, enough said, let's move to some code and let's do some stuff. Uh, let's see if we are able to um, 
get some stuff going. So first I want to move to my code, VS Code, in a bit. Hopefully it's big enough. I cannot increase the font because then I have like less space myself and it's maybe even harder to understand. As I said, the code is all in my GitHub repo, um, so um, you, will, you can find it later on if you want to read it in more detail. So what I have here is a console app, and there is a package. And let me quickly show you um, the package itself. And there's a single package called document processor, which is a version which is inside. So this package, I created for this purpose, right, for this demo, because I don't want to use something that's on the internet. I will explain later on why. But it has a single package, right? That's how it looks. But if we say, please show me all packages that come with that one, we will see that the list is much larger, right? Aside from all the .NET stuff we have, if we scroll up a bit, you will see it also has Bouncy Castle, which is probably some cryptography. And we see it also relies on iTex 7, which is a library you can use to generate PDFs, right? So you would say single library, no, there's a lot more underneath and that comes with that. So that's like the transitive example. So what does this library do? It processes documents, as the name indicates. And it's pretty straightforward. It's, its API says like, hey, you can process a document, you will have an input file and it will produce an output file. And in this case, I'm running this in a console app, so it will just refer to two paths. Um, let's just run it. You will see I'm going to do it in the console. You will see that um, it will execute and it will take a file that's the input, which in this case is a schedule that shows this session, and it will generate a file and it will write that file to the output folder. One problem it has, or one feature, depending on how you look at it, is the fact that I can also write full files to other folders. So if I just remove the output folder and say, let's write this to schedule and do exactly the same again, you will see that it will write the file to the root folder. So in technical terms, if this would happen in a library that runs inside a web application or maybe in, in a console application for that matter, this is something we call a path reversal. So somebody has the ability to control where paths or files get written to. And yes, this is a console app. I'm typing it myself, but you could probably imagine if this is running behind, let's say, an ASP.NET controller and the data is not properly validated, right? We should always validate our data before it ends up in any field. Like we need to make sure that it make, meets all our constraints before we process it. But in this case, let's assume that that's the case. We are able to write files to any arbitrary location throughout this library. The second feature or problem it also has is the following. Let me close this. Let me minimize the side one again. If you pass on file names, it will copy files. If you pass on URLs as the first argument of the source, it will go to that website and download the HTML as we would see over here. So if I now do, have I saved this just to be sure. And if I now run it again, it's running, it's executing. We will see it has not generated a file. Hold on a second. Where did it write to? Make sure that we save this one again. Let's go back. I think I might miss out on internet. That's exactly the reason. Let me quickly connect and see if it works. And DC Porto. Now we're going to get all the notifications of people like, hey, what are you up doing, Niels? Are you like working? No, I'm presenting and everybody can see this. <laughs> Let's hold on a second. I think this is good. Let's try it again. And now it works. So it will generate an HTML file. Always check your connectivity before you do demos. This is just HTML that you get from the first page if you go to NDC Porto, right? So implicitly, and that's done by the library, so the library does accept file pass as first argument, but it also decides to go to the internet if it sees a URL. And if this is run inside a server context, then there is a problem that we call server-side request forgery. So 
assume that this is run in ASP.NET controller, somebody has the ability to control that field, I can do requests from that server to other services that are like connected to that machine or that part of that network, right? And what we have seen in the past is that AWS S3 bucket keys are stolen like that because you can maybe read out environment variables, right? You can do a lot more. You can maybe see what's, what's, what, what else is connected on that machine. Maybe it's some uh, reverse proxy you get on it, but then you can look at the machine itself. So it has a lot of possibilities and a lot of the hacks um, have maybe a chain of stuff that's happening in server-side request forgery can be the first one. So implicitly, this library does that and does those two things. And those are, in my case, I think problematic. And yes, we could um, do a better job by making sure our code deals with it once we get data back, but I want to do it a bit differently, right? So let me quickly just recap. Um, we want to solve the problem. We want to say, okay, I want to use the package as is, and this is the disclaimer, and this is the reason why I created my own package. Because if you go to NuGet and download something, um, you need to make sure you comply with the license of the package. And nine out of 10 times, the license will say like, you're not allowed to reverse or look into its internals for that matter, right? So if you want to do something with a library, make sure you check it before you do it, because it might not be allowed. And what I want to achieve is, I want to change the behavior of the library. I want to use the library as is, but I want to have control over uh, opening documents directly. And I don't want it to be able to use URLs to go external. Secondly, I also want to have control over where it writes files to, and only for that library, right? So yes, for the internet stuff, the first thing, if you have a Docker container that has no egress, then you can, like no internet access, you can probably solve that problem. That's a layer of defense. This could be an additional layer of defense, right? That you will put inside your code. And those are like the several ways to fix this. And I think that, that should be the key for this uh, solution. So this is not like, I'm gonna show a concept and this should maybe hopefully be an additional thing that we can do. So what are the things that we've got available for this piece? So what can we do? Um, in order to fix this. So code access security heavily relied on a concept called app domains, but with .NET Core, there's only a single app domain from the start. They've never done multiples. It's probably impossible, but that's not the case. Luckily, they did expose one of its internals and that's called assembly load context. And that's gonna be really important for the next steps we're gonna take because an assembly load context can replace the isolation mechanism provided by multiple app domains instances within the .NET framework. But it also allows you to scope and load and unload assemblies. And um, even better, it allows you to run multiple versions of the same assembly within a single process. And this is probably the demo you have seen so I think uh, David Fowler showed it at NDC Oslo a couple of years ago, where he has like um, one part of his program relied on Newton JSoft, uh, Newton Soft JSON version one, and the other one had a different one. And he was able to run them next to each other in a single process by implementing his own assembly load context. So um, one key thing, and that's also what they mentioned in the documents on assembly load context, that it's not a security thing. It's not a security feature, because keep in mind that the code will still have access to all the system resources similarly as the process, right? But as I said, keep in mind, we want to have an additional layer of defense. That's my goal. But it does allow us to have control over what's get loaded when. And I think that's the key. And I thought like when I was reading through it, and reading through the specs, I thought like this is potential. So what are we gonna do next with the project we saw before? We need to have a way to um, use the library and we need to have a way to use the library within the console app, but we don't want to reference it. So we need to have some kind of contract, which of course is an interface. And that interface will be the shared project between the things that we're gonna do. Then of course, we need to get rid of the fact that the console app has no reference to the document processor and it only knows the interface. And then we need to have a separate library that will do all the heavy lifting for us for the sandbox. We need to add the document processor package and then we're gonna focus on a thing which is called self-contained deployment. And that's also a key aspect of this concept. So what you can do with a .NET application, you can publish an application being self-contained, which means that a folder that you publish to, which targets, in my case, targets, targets my Mac, will have all binaries it needs in order to execute, right? So that folder will have full framework, it will have native libraries it uses on my system, and it will be there. Um, so if we have control over 
where it loads stuff and we point it to that folder, then we might be able to mingle with what's inside that folder, right? So that's in, in essence the thing we want to achieve. So it's time to get back to some code. And I'm just going to talk you through briefly um, to make sure and I'm not going to change the code because that's probably the demo gods will push me back and say like, no, Niels, don't do that. So we have a solution called middle. There's a start spot. That's the, the, that's the first demo. And then we have a middle piece. Let me open up that one. Well, I already put in all the stuff that I mentioned in the slide before. And after we're done, I'm going to recap it with a diagram that you have some idea what's inside. Right. So first, as I said, we need to have a library which is just exactly mimicking the thing that we want to do we want to process documents there are two arguments it will give results back right straightforward nothing fancy if we then look into the console app itself the console app only has a reference to the I interface project that's it that, that's that, that's the only thing it needs it needs to know how the interface looks and there's another implementation that we need in order to load it, which is our assembly load context. But first, let me move to the library itself. So the document processor has moved to its own class project. It also references the interface, and that's about it, right? And inside of this project, we will have a call to, um, to the library. And I put in a console, right, just to show you some stuff once I run this demo. Well, you see over here, it will look into the context of my processor because that's how this thing is called and it will show us where http client get loaded gets loaded from what's the assembly location of our http client right because that's the thing we want to like I, that's the thing i want to show you then we have the processor we instantiate and we return the results right so this is the library itself then we need to do the publish and within the library project i will have uh, the following Thing, which is just doing that self-contained deployment as I mentioned before and it targets my Mac itself right so let's just briefly run this let's run this and we will see a folder appear in this tree in the middle I'm in the end I need to go to the other solution hold on a second sure that we have this one let's go into library let's say pub publish and then we see a folder appear over here right in this side and you will see it has all the dll's that the library needs it has the library implementation itself it has some of the native stuff my mac needs in order to execute so that's the thing right so this folder will have those files available let me close this one a bit. Let's go back to the files up. And then we need to have the magic of the load context, right? And this is a lot of code, and I'm not going to, like, in detail talk you through, but there's two concepts I want you to be aware of, right? So this is just implementing the assembly load context. It also uses the assembly load, the assembly dependency resolver, which is a default framework thing that will just look into folders and try to resolve this. Um, there is some type resolving. There's one share type, which is our interface. So that's you're going to see how it gets instantiated. That's how we look. And then it will load assemblies. And it will look into the folder of, um, of the, 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 the root, in this case, the library. And if it finds it, it will return the path. If, and this is in this case, default false. If there is no thing found, it will throw an exception. I'm not able to find this library, right? So that's what we want. We want to have control over what gets loaded when. And for managed libraries, this is the case. For unmanaged libraries, right? Because with our .NET framework, we also rely on some system libraries. In my case, for my Mac, we still need to sometimes rely on what's inside the system. But those are the native libraries a bit. And you also saw in the published script, I remove one single library for that purpose. But that's a native Mac thing. If you run this on Linux, that one won't be there. But we have the same, like try to resolve what's inside the folder, give it back to me, and then we can continue. And then over here, you see, we need to create an instance. And this is taking the load context 
from an assembly name, it will iterate over the types and it will create that instance and use this, right? So this takes care of our isolated load context. And as I said here, we have the folder. And if we then look into the program itself, we will see that there are a couple of differences. Once again, I'm showing you the origin of HTTP client and we saw that inside that library. And if we do a good job, then the HTTP client loaded here should be different than the one that's loaded in the library. Then we create the load context. I'm just pointing out to that this is the library we're starting out with. And now I have a share type called iProcessor. That's the thing. Create instance, do your thing, and do exactly the same with copying those files, right? So if I now run the console, we will see that it shows us that within console app HTTP client, that's that call we saw earlier, resides in shared folder on my Mac. And for the my processor, it looks into the published folder. So that is HTTP client in our library, which is the, a different one than from the main project, right? So from that perspective, I think we have succeeded and we have gotten the, the other framework next to it, which is the same that will then use that one, right? So we can still have our output. We still have our schedule, right? For that matter, that file is still the same. We can also still do the same traversal with paths. That problems are still in because that's the next thing we want to solve. But I want to briefly just recap a bit what, what, what we just saw. So let me get back to the slides and show you. So we started out developing this. We had a default load context. That's our app. We have the console app that has the document processor library next to it. And underneath, there is the whole framework dependencies we rely on, which, of course, is I.O. We do something with files. We need to have HTTP, right? That's the client, of course. And what we have done with this abstraction you saw before is we created the second load context. And you shall also see what we have done with the, with the framework bits, right? So the load context knows the interface. That's been defined. That interface um, will then be used by the console app, but the isolated load context has its own version of the framework that has access to those files, which are in a different folder. So we have taken out the document processor and we created um, that library that does it, and it has its own framework version, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. So this is the stage we're at right now. So what will we be able to do next? And with .NET 5, uh, they heavily also focused on um, removing types, right? Trimming that was done with .NET 5. If you look at a Blazor app and if the Blazor app gets loaded for the first time, you want to have minimal assemblies going over the line because the more data people need to load, the longer it takes for the app, right? So could we maybe just use that trimming and cut out the, the stuff that we don't use, right? Uh, but in my case, I want to be more rigorous. I want to take out more. I don't want to take out the types that I don't use. I also want to have control over the types that are used by the library by maybe changing it a bit. And the question we can ask ourselves is, hey, could we achieve that? And um, this is a bit like weird because now I'm going to fix a third party library problem with another third party library. But uh, this is a really cool one that allows us to patch .NET assemblies. Right, so Harmony 2 is a library that's um, um, done by, I think it's a single person that develops it, and it allows us to um, replace and patch, replace and, and decorate uh, .NET or Mono methods during runtime. So we can do a patch, and that's the one you're going to see in my fix. Or we can do a transpile, which is rewriting IL, and I was really keen on, hey, uh, I honestly don't want to rely on runtime stuff, right? That, that's maybe stuff that can still go wrong for some reasons. Uh, if you want to do a transpile, then you will rewrite the IL, which might be a better solution, right? Um, so the first, the first demos I did with this, um, with assembly load context, so Nate McMaster, he is a guy who used to work on the ASP.NET team, and he has created a plugins manager that he showed that could use similar, like multiple versions of the same assembly within ASP.NET Core. And he had a load context implementation similarly like this. Um, and what I did in my first demos, um, let's say I wanted to take care of HTTP client, I just took it out 
and just implemented a stop for it and then just put that one back, which also works. Um, but I thought it's much nicer to have like, if we want to do more policy-wide things, then it would be better to have something we can program against and Harmony is a, is a real cool library to do that. So let's move into the code again, because that's cool. And um, let's dig into how we can use Harmony to solve some of the problems we've seen. Just a second. So let me switch to the end. You already saw that, so let's go up one more. That's the end solution. Let me just get rid of pub. And let me just open this here. So what we hear is all, see this all the same, right? So the isolated load context, same implementation. We will see um, the same types resolving happening. Um, there's some additional code I'm gonna explain later on because that proves that we have done a good job. And there's the library, right? And as I said, the library right now has a, an additional reference to Harmony. And what do we then need to do in order to fix this? So first of all, as I said, we're gonna uh, apply patches and Harmony has a declarative model where you can say, okay, let's patch this type. Let's take the method copy because I know internally uh, that the library uses this because yeah, I wrote it myself, but let's say you looked into its internals and you know that it does a file.copy at some stage and that's causing the file to be written to that folder we saw before. I want to have control of that one. I say like, hey, do take this method, first argument is string, second argument is also string and patch it. So what I'm doing here is, this is a prefix that so this method will be called before it executes. So I say, hey, please give me a canonicalized path name, right? So get full path, it's always good. If you look at path reversal problems, um, dot dot slash or tilde, right, in file names that allows people to have access to different files. Uh, with get full path that will be normalized and you want to create the path itself then you want to normalize and then you want to check it against a folder you expect it to be in and that's exactly what I'm doing here I'm saying like hey um, in this case I want to be sure that the path that I get will have is part of this folder or is inside of that folder that will fix it and if that's not the case then I'm going to say hey you're not allowed to write files outside of this location, right? So this is the first patch. The second patch, as I said before, is related to HTTP client. And I know for the given fact that the library uses a get stream async to fetch data from the internet and save that file. And what I'm doing here is like, hey, I'm just gonna say you're not allowed to use this method and throw a not supported exception, which will happen at runtime, of course, right? So you can probably imagine if you have a library inside your organization and you want everybody to use it in the same way, but there is behavior inside that library that you have reviewed that you said like, hey, I don't want people to use this, then this might be an approach on taking care of that. And if everybody then tests their app, right? And at some point they want to maybe functionally check if everything's okay, then you should be able to, um, to cross check this and limit its capabilities by saying, hey, you're not allowed to load this, right? Then the other piece is we also need to patch itself. And what Harmony uh, needs, it needs to be instantiated and it needs to be created an instance saying, hey, okay, this is my processor. And then I'm gonna say patch all and fix and fix the apply the fixes that we have just identified, right? This is all still the same. We have the type being resolved, right? So let's move on and let me quickly do one piece in the console app before I start it. Let me just quickly do, so I want to save this one for after the first run. So this is doing exactly the same, right? It, it, it takes the load context, it executes it, and we're first gonna copy a file and we're gonna copy it to, um, we're gonna copy it to docs Niels. Let's first, let's try to put it in the root. 
that's this is the thing I fixed. So am I in the right folder? No. Yeah, this is the one the console app. Have I saved this one? Let me close this for just to be sure. And what I, I forgot one thing, and this is one I also had in the last demo I gave. I need to publish the files again because I changed some of the bits, right? So let me just briefly do that. Library pub sh run that script. We need to see the pub folder appear again here, right? That's cool. So now we should be in a better place. Console app. Let me get rid of this one. Don't that run. And what we see over here is I, I showed you already. This is the call that we're doing, right? The, the copying of the file. Right? So that was it's being written out. I should not do this, I should just show it. We see that it says false. You're not allowed to write the file outside of the folder, right? So that's the patch that we have applied on the library by doing the harmony execution. So this worked. So and you say like Niels, are you like faking us? Are we still allowed to do the file output? Let's check that again. So it should be output. And now we can do the same again. Save this, yeah, just to be sure. And if we now look in output, we see that the file is created because this is the folder I'm allowed to write to, right? So we have changed that execution path for that single piece. So that worked. Second, the HTTP request that we had the patch for where we're just going to say, you're not allowed to use this anymore. All right, so let's comment out the first execution, let's move into the second one, but we're just going to say um, NDC portal and I want you to write out this file. Let's see what happens. Save it, close it, let's just be paranoid with this and then do .NET run. And what we see over here is this line. It says our exception management, uh, our exception that we thrown, saying like, "Hey, you're not allowed to use this method." So we have control over over these kinds of things, right? And when I started out this demo, I commented out a couple of lines, and maybe some of you have already seen it. But that those lines are mimicking the exact same functionality I have patched, but this is only in the context of the main app. So let's do uncomment. Let's keep this like this. So what, what I'm doing here is I'm doing the get stream async to NDC Porto, and then I'm doing a file write to that folder by just creating it and copy it, right? So if I run this, again, did I save it? Yes. There's nothing um, that you see over here, but it did download the content again, but this is of course done in the HTTP client that, that we haven't patched, right? This is the same one. So in this case, I've shown you this is successfully taking an additional framework next to it, using it only for that library. We have control over stuff that gets loaded by doing the, the patches we saw before. And let me go back to the slides and then show you some conceptual drawings. And then with 10 minutes left, I'm going to wrap up and then we probably have five minutes left and then we're like five minutes before the queue starts. That's good. It's all about food, <laughs> as you can see how I look, right? So um, what have we done? So you imagine you, you saw this picture before. The only thing I've done with the isolated load context is I've taken out the stuff that I don't want it to use, right? You should have done a trim. I haven't done that because there's one downside. Harmony relies on a couple of things that still need to be there. So hopefully they get rid of it. Harmony does binary formatter inside of it with some serialization, but they're moving it to JSON. So I should be able to get rid of it in the future. But as you see in the right side has its own libraries and has the patch ones, right? So we're able to sandbox it. So with that said, um, I'm just going to um, wrap up a bit and conclude. 
as I said before, if you look at security problems as a whole, and if you would talk to me as a security practitioner, it's always a good idea to integrate security inside your development lifecycle, right? Make sure you update your libraries, you do proper input validation, you use libraries as how they were intended to use. I would also encourage you to look into, hey, what do I expect from this library? So I've also done a talk on third party libraries where I show a tool that you can use to dump what's inside a library pretty easily. And you can easily skim over some of the calls it's doing. And that's what I use myself. If I start out reviewing an SDK, I would first do that dump myself and look if there are some juicy API calls that I know are pretty like vulnerable or have possibilities. Um, so be aware of what's inside, right? Know what libraries are used and know what's inside. Integrate um, those 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 things and also what you expect from it, right? And security, of course, means static analysis, maybe some pen testing. Of course, you start out with a trap model, like what are the risks that I'm facing? Because we can throw technology against security problems, but if it's too complex, then that doesn't help. So it's, it needs to be all of that. If I look at the concept that I created and this is sandbox concept, I'm honestly gonna say to you, like, would a developer do it like this? Probably not, because it's too complex. Like all the steps you need to take in order to get this working, what I've done. Would be cool if I can do a easier developer generation, like uh, integration by a source generator, for example. I wanted to have reliance on a package that I create, but I only wanted to generate source and the package should go away. That's one of my goals. And have some good guidance on how to use it. And also, I don't want people maybe to write patches. It would be cool if you've got some kind of a builder pattern, like if you would use this concept in, let's say, ASP.NET Core. And if you if you start out the whole thing and you do your builder, it would be cool if you can just like do a policy, say like, hey, it can only access these files because right now I've only patched that single call because that's the one that's being used by my library. I know that, but it, w it, it needs to be much broader and that needs to be done with a lot of caution looking at the framework and see like, hey, this does file operations, this one does it as well. But it would be cool if we can do that and then have basic patches or policies that you can apply on this. So with that said, um, the Git repo I mentioned where everything is in, including all the build scripts, um, are in this repo in NDC Porto on my GitHub. If you want to reach out to me, there's my email, I'm on Twitter. I have a blog post where you can see also videos of recordings of other talks I've done. And I'm going to say to you, obrigado, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference, the rest of the afternoon. And I'm going to be around, so if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, thank you. Are there any questions or do you want to go to lunch? I don't mind. Either way. We also can do lunch and questions at the same time. That might be a good alternative. Technically, this is some, it's, it's, it's wrapping, right? Because that additional layer of abstraction, it would be cool if that shell is just available for you to use then and don't need to worry about all the additional steps, right? I think that, that should be the, the, the most positive outcome for me at least. But That will be a one layer of defense, right? For sure. makes it more complex eh? yes and i know uh, there's a lot of security products that make it even more complex and then it will work the opposite way for sure right people will try to circumvent stuff in a different way yeah but the concept and that's that's the thing that i'm most interested in cool thank you thank you everyone